in Defeating Darwinism by Opening Minds. Chapter 5. Intelligent Design. George C. Williams is not as well known to the public as Richard Dawkins or Stephen Jay Gould, but he is one of the world's most respected and influential evolutionary biologists. He is best known for pioneering the gene selection version of Darwinism, which was popularized by Dawkins in The Selfish Gene. Very briefly, gene selectionism says that natural selection selects genes, not whole organisms. However fit a plant or animal may be, in the end it dies and returns to the dust of the earth. What remains are its genes encoded in DNA. Because the genes were passed on to the next generations in the process of reproduction. This means that genes, rather than bodies or minds, are the central actors in the evolutionary drama. The story of life then goes something like this The Story of Life, starring Gene. In the beginning, there was a naked gene that somehow evolved from a chemical soup. This gene had two important properties. It could reproduce by copying itself, and it could engage in some sort of chemical activity analogous to eating. Mistakes were made in the copying process, and so the descendants of the first gene had varying capabilities. Those that were better at eating and especially reproducing left more offspring than their less proficient sisters and cousins, and so the Darwinian process of natural selection could begin. Eventually, some genes learn to make bodies in a process we now call embryonic development. As applied to humans, that's the development of the baby in the mother's womb. Those genes that could make bodies had a competitive advantage in the struggle for survival, all the more so as their bodybuilding capabilities improved. A slogan humorously captures the basic idea. A chicken is just an egg's way of making another egg. Gene selectionists talk and write as if genes can think and plan strategies for survival. They do not mean this literally, of course, but as a metaphor for a process that is directed only by the blind force of natural selection. In brief, the gene selection theory posits that particular types of genes improve their own chances for survival by making or improving organisms that are themselves good at surviving and reproducing. Natural selection thus ensures that the world will be dominated by those types of genes that happen to be good at making plants and animals that are good at passing their own genes on to descendants. Gene selectionism is an example of what philosophers call reductionism. Reductionists claim that everything, including our minds, can be reduced to its material base. For example, Dawkins has written that the discovery of the structure of DNA and its genetic code has dealt the final killing blow to the belief that living material is deeply distinct from non-living material. Life is matter and only matter. Dawkins does not flinch from applying this philosophy to human beings. We are survival machines, robot vehicles blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules of DNA known as genes. The only purpose of life is DNA survival. A person is nothing more than DNA's way of making more DNA like itself. That's materialist reductionism as articulated by Richard Dawkins, today's most influential evolutionary biologist. Information and the Word Although George C. Williams did more than anyone to develop the gene selection theory, he seems to be having second thoughts about the underlying reductionism. In a 1994 book, supplemented here by an interview published in 1995, he endorsed the very different idea that life contains a distinct non-material component called information. Because this subject is so important and controversial, I'd better quote his exact words. Evolutionary biologists have failed to realize that they work with two more or less incommensurable domains, that of information and that of matter. 
These two domains can never be brought together in any kind of the sense usually implied by the term reductionism. The gene is a package for information, not an object. The pattern of base pairs in a DNA molecule specifies the gene, but the DNA molecule is the medium. It's not the message. Maintaining this distinction between the median and the message is absolutely indispensable to clarity of thought about evolution. Just the fact that 15 years ago I started using a computer may have had something to do with my ideas here. The constant process of transferring information from one physical medium to another and then being able to recover the same information in the original medium brings home the separability of information and matter. In biology, when you're talking about things like genes and genotypes and gene pools, we're talking about information, not physical objective reality. Williams uses the novel Don Quixote as his example of the matter information duality. A computer operating system like Windows 95 would provide a similar example. A book or a computer program contains complex information recorded in matter whether the matter be ink and paper or a silicon disk. The information can be switched from one medium to another or even stored in the human brain. The content of the book or the computer program is not specified by the physical or chemical laws governing the medium. If it were, all books would be alike, or perhaps would differ according to the qualities of the ink and paper used to write them. In fact, the content of the message is independent of the physical makeup of the medium. Don Quixote loses nothing of its meaning or literary quality if it is printed on the cheapest paper, and a trashy romance novel does not improve in quality if it is printed on expensive silk. The medium and the message are two entirely different kinds of things. As Williams explains, you can speak of galaxies and particles of dust in the same terms because they both have mass and charge and length and width. You can't do that with information and matter. Information doesn't have mass or charge or length in millimeters. Likewise, matter doesn't have bytes. This dearth of shared descriptors makes matter and information two separate domains of existence, which have to be discussed separately in their own terms. That way of describing reality brings to mind the biblical description of how the world began. The Gospel of John begins with the memorable statement that in the beginning was the Word. That is exactly how we would describe the creation of a literary work, or a computer program, or a building. In the beginning was the concept, and the working out of that concept in the mind of the author or designer. Thereafter, the concept was recorded or realized in matter. Matter is important, but secondary. The word, or information, is not reducible to matter, and even precedes matter. If only matter existed in the beginning, then the first verse of the Gospel of John and the worldview of the Bible is false. In the beginning were the particles and everything else came only from them. A reductionist understanding of the universe leaves no room for God, much less for the Word of God. If everything came from matter, and if the information in the living organisms is located in genes made of DNA, then it seems logical to suppose that DNA and life are virtually the same thing. Williams singled out Dawkins for criticism on this point as one who defines a replicator in a way that makes it a physical entity duplicating itself in a reproductive process, adding that Dawkins was misled by the fact that genes are always identified with DNA. If Dawkins has been misled, however, it is not for some trivial reason. It is because highly complex information that is independent of matter implies an intelligent source that produces the information. And the main point of Darwinism for Dawkins is to eliminate that possibility from consideration. To see why this is so, consider the crucial role of an author in producing the information in a book. Williams himself uses this analogy, and anybody who uses a word processor can see at once what he means. 
a book isn't just ink and paper. This book you are reading, like any other, contains information written on paper with ink. The information did not always take that physical form, however. Originally, I wrote it on a word processor and it existed only as an electronic file on a computer disk. I sent some completed chapters by email to friends and colleagues for criticism. The information in each chapter was exactly the same, whether it was recorded on paper or on a computer disk in some fragmented and disembodied form as it moved over the links of the internet. Information is also stored by some poorly understood means in our brains. If all the copies of Shakespeare's plays were destroyed, nothing would be permanently lost. Actors who had learned the roles could easily recreate the texts from memory. Such examples tell us that information is an entirely different kind of stuff from the physical medium in which it may be temporarily recorded. It would be absurd to try to explain the literary quality or meaning of a book as an emergent property of the physical qualities of its ink and paper. The message comes from an author. Ink and paper are merely the media. Similarly, the information written in DNA is not the product of DNA. Where did the information come from? Who or what is the author? Physical laws cannot be the answer to that question. These laws do produce some fairly complex structures such as snowflakes and crystals. In such cases, the laws produce the same structure over and over again with chance variations. Repetitive order has a very low information content. The same laws that form the crystals prevent any more complex ordering from emerging because they ensure that the same pattern will always be repeated according to the formula. Similarly, we might create a sort of book by programming a computer with a formula like this one. Keep repeating the word stuff until the printer runs out of paper. A book written that way would be very boring to read and it would never get more interesting even if we kept on printing forever. The only variety would come from an occasional typographical error. Otherwise, it would just be more stuff all the way to eternity. If physical laws cannot provide the information in a book, could random chance do the job? I won't bore you with the math, but just about everybody, including Richard Dawkins, agrees that it is essentially impossible to produce a coherent book of average length by randomly combining letters, spaces, and punctuation marks. Even a single sentence like in the beginning was the word is extremely unlikely to come from pouring out a random mix of letters and spaces. As I said, this is undisputed. Some do say, however, that chance can do the job if it is combined with some principle of selection. Era's blunder again. Many people with underpowered baloney detectors have been misled on this critical point by common Darwinian application of Barron's blunder. It actually is possible to produce a written text by supplying random letters if some selector, like a computer program, preserves every letter that happens to end up in the right place. Thus, we can get in the beginning was the word if the program supplies random letters until an I happens to appear in the first space, or a D in the final space, and so on. Whenever a letter appears in the correct slot, the program preserves it there, like the uncovered letters in the TV program Wheel of Fortune. Very soon, the spaces will all be filled with the correct letters, and we will have the whole sentence. The whole thing seems absurdly easy, so easy that you ought to smell a rat. With a fast enough computer generating thousands of random letters a second, we can reproduce the whole Bible in a matter of hours, plus the Chicago telephone directory as a bonus. All we have to do is write the Bible and whatever else we want into the computer's memory first and have the computer preserve the desired letters in the right places until all the spaces are filled. Richard Dawkins actually uses examples like this to illustrate the creative power of natural selection, and his readers apparently don't see that it's just a trick. 
If a computer selection program can duplicate a library that easily, can't natural selection make an organism? You probably have spotted the trick already, but I'll explain it just to make sure. Computer selection, like automobile design, illustrates intelligent planning or authorships, not chance or survival of the fittest. It is just as if an author were writing the target phrase, except that the author has to wait a bit for the right letters to appear in the right spaces. The first letters to appear are meaningless and the computer knows which ones to select only because it has the target text in its memory. Natural selection, on the other hand, is supposed to be mindless and hence incapable of pursuing a distant goal. If natural selection could preserve a presently meaningless mutation because it might become useful later on when other new mutations occur, this would imply that evolution is a purposeful process, supervised by a pre-existing mind. As we have seen, supervised evolution is a gradualist version of creationism. As materialists use the term, it is not evolution at all. Let's review what we know. So far, we have the following basic points. First, life consists not just of matter, chemicals, but of matter and information. Second, information is not reducible to matter, but is a different kind of stuff altogether. A theory of life thus has to explain not just the origin of the matter, but also the independent origin of the information. Third, complex, specified information of the kind found in a book or a biological cell cannot be produced either by chance or at the direction of physical and chemical laws. Attempts to prove that it can typically employ variations on Barra's blunder. With those general principles in mind, now let's go to the biology. Are organisms designed or are they the products of unintelligent natural causes? Opening the Black Boxes of Biology to answer that question, we have to look underneath the surface of life to the biochemistry underneath. The biologists of the 19th and early 20th centuries who established Darwinism and materialism as scientific orthodoxy knew little of the biochemistry and imagined the cells to be something rather simple that could just ooze itself up out of the, some chemical broth. The term black box grew out of the efforts of scientists to expose medical hoaxes. A quack doctor might offer to cure whatever ails you by hooking you up to a mysterious black machine with all sorts of dials and switches on the cover, but nothing inside. More generally, any machine that does wonderful things by a mechanism nobody knows is called a black box. The computers on which we write are black boxes to most authors because we have only the vaguest ideas of how they work. Without a knowledge of molecular biology, bodily functions like vision and blood clotting are black boxes. We know they work wonders, but we don't know how they work. Without that detailed knowledge, a biologist's notion of how, say, vision might evolve is as valueless as my speculations about how to build a computer. In his book, Darwin's Black Box, molecular biologist Michael Behe explains that scientists have begun to open the black boxes of biology, and they have revealed a fantastically complex world of interacting proteins and enzymes underneath. Here, just to give an example, is Behe's description of part of the molecular mechanism for vision. When light first strikes the retina, a photon interacts with a molecule called 11-cis-retinol, which rearranges within picoseconds to transretinol. A picosecond is about the time it takes light to travel the breadth of a single human hair. The change in the shape of the retinol molecule forces a change in the shape of the protein rhodopsin, to which the retinol is tightly bound. The protein's metamorphosis alters its behavior. Now called metrohodopsin-2, the protein sticks to another protein called transducin. Before bumping into 
natorohodopsin-2, transducin has tightly bound a small molecule called GDP. But when the transducin interacts with the metorohodopsin-2, the GDP falls off, and a molecule called GTP binds to transducin. GTP is closely related to, but critically different from GDP. There is a lot more like that, but don't worry, I'm not going to inflict it on you. If you are interested in molecular biology, go read Behe's book. If not, all you need to understand is that molecular mechanisms are irreducibly complex. What this means is simply that they are made up of many parts that interact in complex ways and all the parts need to work together. Any single part has no useful function unless all the other parts are also present. There is therefore no pathway of functional intermediate stages by which a Darwinian process could build such a system step by tiny step. Molecular mechanism, Behe says, are as obviously designed as a spaceship or a computer. You can't explain the origin of any biological capability like vision unless you can explain the origin of the molecular mechanisms that make it work. Evolutionary biologists have been able to pretend to know how complex biological systems originated only because they treated them as black boxes. Now that biochemists have opened the black boxes and seen what is inside, they know that Darwinian theory is just a story, not a scientific explanation. The Attempt to Climb Mount Improbable Behe published his book in 1996, the same year in which Richard Dawkins published The Climbing Mount Improbable. The mountain of Dawkins' title is Biological Complexity, because Dawkins cheerfully acknowledges that plants and animals really are extremely complicated and that the analogy we have made to books and computers is valid. In his vivid words, physics books may be complicated, but the objects and phenomena that a physics book describes are simpler than a single cell in the body of its author. And the author consists of trillions of those cells, many of them different from each other, organized with intricate architecture and precision engineering into a working machine capable of writing a book. Each nucleus contains a digitally coded database larger in information content than all 30 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica put together. And this figure is for each cell, not all the cells of the body put together. Dawkins rules out the possibility that such a database could be created all at once. To do that would require prodigious mind and hence would amount to supernatural creation. Just as a mountain climber has to go up a mountain step by step, biological evolution has to go through a series of intermediate functional steps in order to create each biological system, including the mind and the body of the author of that physics book. Each step requires a random mutation, usually defined as copying error in the reproduction of DNA. This means that steps must be very small indeed, because mutations that are large enough to have visible effects on the organism are nearly always harmful or even fatal. We may not see the intermediate steps today, but every Darwinist must believe that they once existed as actual living organisms. If such a thing as truly irreducible complexity actually exists, Dawkins concedes, then the functional intermediate steps could not have existed and Darwinism is not true. Who's right, Dawkins or Behe? And is the argument about science or about philosophy? Behe says, and I agree, that the dispute is mainly philosophical. Science, he writes, is published in professional, peer-reviewed scientific journals. Behe's search of the professional journals reveals the absence of any serious efforts to lay out plausible, testable scenarios for the step-by-step -step evolution of molecular mechanisms. Such half-hearted attempts, as exist, are full of what scientists call hand-waving. 
new molecular steps mysteriously stand forth or emerge or just appear without any realistic mechanism. Molecular biologists don't even attempt to fill in the Darwinian theory with specific examples because they don't know how to do it. The textbooks typically endorse Darwinism in general terms in the introductory chapter and thereafter ignore it. Most molecular biologists accept Darwinism uncritically because they are scientific materialists and have no alternative. But the Darwinian mechanism plays no role in their science. And we'll continue with this chapter in the next video. Thanks so much for listening. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.